should be great. Um, we're, the process for today's webinar um, is we're going to be covering off a conversation with Glenn Brindicombe, who is co-chair of uh, CAMI, um, which uh, represents a number of um, uh, mental health facing organizations. I'm sure you can tell us a little bit about the organization. I am Michael Cooper. <clears throat> I am uh, Vice President, Mental Health Research Canada. Uh, I oversee all of our data collection projects, including the one you're gonna hear about today. Um, Brittany Saab is my colleague. Brittany, did you wanna say hello? Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming and happy full second day of spring. I know we're getting some people coming in from all over the country. I hope you're all getting some very nice weather out there. <laughs> I am MHRC's Manager of Partnerships and Strategic Initiatives. Thank you, Brittany. Um, I also neglected to do the land acknowledgement. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge that Mental Health Research Canada's headquarters are located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewas, and the Haudenosaunee, uh, the Wendat people, and is now home, of course, to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Um, my apologies for not doing that earlier. Uh, Glenn, did you want to do an introduction of yourself? Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Glenn Brimacombe. I am the chair of the Public Affairs Committee for the Canadian Alliance on Mental Illness and Mental Health. My day job, I am the Director of Policy and Public Affairs at the Canadian Psychological Association. A pleasure to be here with all of you. Great. Um, and my colleague, Rianne, is joining us. Um, I'm, I'm sure she's, uh, it's good to see you, Rian, uh, on camera. I'm not sure why I'm on camera. Okay, hold on. I'll uh, I'll turn off your camera because I don't know why you're on camera Thank either. You. No problem. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, but uh, I guess you were logged into our our Mental Health Research Canada Zoom account. That's my most likely scenario. Uh, so we'll get started. We'll we'll cover off a conversation with Glenn and then we'll go through our poll fifteen results. Uh, I think we've scheduled forty five minutes to an hour. Um, we'll do twenty minutes or so with Glenn. Some time for some Q and A. Brittany will be monitoring the Q and A. Uh, and then we'll go through our poll 15 results, which would be data tracking the mental health of Canadians from February 2023. Right, perfect. Let's get started. I will pull up your presentation, Glenn. Thank you. So um, I guess this sets the context for the discussion that uh, Michael, Brittany, and myself will have after. I have a very short deck um, to present and it really reflects uh, the release of a survey that we released yesterday, along with partners from Mental Health Research Canada and Polara. And um, all of you probably know Mental Health Research Canada does, I think, extremely good work in this space. It, it is niche driven. It adds value. It fills a gap uh, when it comes to better understanding the mental health of Canadians in a variety of different ways, uh, populations, regions, uh, settings, and by mental health diagnosis. What we thought we would do from the Canadian Alliance on Mental Illness and Mental Health, again, is try and fill a gap. And we have a lot of information out there, survey information that speaks to the mental health of Canadians, but we thought we'd take it in a slightly different direction. And knowing that patient slash client satisfaction is one dimension of quality in the system. Uh, aside from asking them some general questions around access to care, uh, wait times, uh, the need for benchmarks, evidence-based guidelines, we thought we'd ask a specific population of those that have accessed the system in the last 12 months and get a barometer as to how they are seeing the system from the inside. Many public opinion surveys are just asking the public for their impression of an issue, and that's important, don't get me wrong, but we thought we'd kind of dig deep uh, or deeper and get a better sense about what people who are going through the system are actually experiencing. The other piece too that's a bit different is that we thought we'd ask them the question basically to rate their provincial territory or provincial experience. We didn't include the territories this time, just given sampling, uh, small sample issues statistical methodological issues, but we thought we'd ask, and we're taking a page out of here from the wait time alliance and the report card that the Canadian Medical Association has used in the past, which they do not use anymore. But we just thought there would be value in asking Canadians who've accessed uh, mental health services and a mental health care professional to grade 
their experience and grade their province's performance when it comes to the overall mental health system. And if you, you go to the next slide, please. Uh, sorry, two more, skip two more. Thank you. This is where we came out with, uh, in effect, a report card on provincial mental health system performance. Uh, not particularly pretty, to say the least. I know if my mother saw I had a, a report card like that, uh, I know I was in trouble, let alone would be in trouble. Um, clearly, the provinces have room to improve. They can do much, much better in terms of the client experience when it comes to accessing care. Six provinces are graded a D. Three provinces are graded an F. We do not have Prince Edward Island included in this, again, simply because of some sampling, uh, sample size issues in terms of it being too small to have a um, margin of error that we would have uh, and we could publish with confidence. But it does show us there are some challenges. And in some ways, uh, this is probably um, confirming or affirming what many of us think and feel when we talk to our friends, family, colleagues about the performance of the system, that it, it, if it is a system to begin with, but that the experience that we have in terms of accessing care and accessing mental health care professionals is poor. Now, that shouldn't be too surprising in the sense that when you think about our publicly funded healthcare system, there's a very narrow portal of entry. I mean, historically, our system is hospitals and doctors. And if you want to access care, you can go see a family doctor, you can see a psychiatrist, you can see a salaried mental health professional in a hospital, could be a psychologist, social worker, counselor, you might have access to peer support, but it is relatively narrow in the context of our system. And this is one of the key messages that emerges from this in the sense as we think around health system renewal, health system innovation in the mental health and substance use health space is that we need to be thinking about accelerating our investment into the system. Right now at a national level, we invest about 7% of each uh, public health dollar into mental health and substance use health. What CAMI has recommended, which is con consistent with the Royal Society of Canada's recommendation is that should be that proportion should be 12%. So 12% of each provincial territorial budget at a minimum should be invested into mental health and substance use health. And that is aligned, not identical, but it's aligned with other G7 countries in terms of what they invest. And here I'm thinking of France, the United Kingdom and Germany. So there is more that we can do there. We need to grow the workforce in the context of making sure that we have an adequate supply of mental health care professionals. And in some provinces right now, um, and for example, to the credit of the Canadian Medical Association and the College of Family Physicians of Canada, they are actively talking about more integrated team-based interdisciplinary models of care that are needed that include mental health care professionals. And given the fact that it, there is a quote unquote shortage of family physicians, one in five, one in seven Canadians cannot find family physicians and their extensive wait times in terms of getting access to psychiatry in this country. Um, we need to think differently as to how we organize and deliver care in the mental health substance use space. So that's an important piece that's attached to it. And it's also important, one of the things that I take a bit of encouragement from is when I look at what the provinces are actually doing. So uh, there are innovative models that are being introduced, whether they're in Nova Scotia, Quebec, Ontario, with the Ontario Structured Psychotherapy Program, just as an example, you know, in Alberta and British Columbia, they're more actively looking about how can we expand mental health professionals in the context of uh, primary care networks and just integrated or family clinics. So there is some movement looking at child and youth. You see the integrated youth services model in BC, the foundry model which is not only in BC, it's expanding quite rapidly across the country and the Graham Beck Foundation has been absolutely critical in, in growing, seeding, developing that model, model along with CIHR and the provinces. So there is some activity going and moving forward, the sense is we're not doing enough and we need to do more quicker. Now, one of the related pieces to this uh, that I just, and I'm happy to stop there, Michael and, and Brittany, if, the, if you want me to, and we can, if there's any questions that you want to engage in, is the federal piece. So most of you, perhaps all of you know about the recent mating dance between the federal government and the provinces and territories a couple of, year, a couple of weeks ago, 
which produced you know, a bombastic number of $196 billion. And to me, that, as a colleague of mine would say, that plays into the S&M agenda, agenda. That's smoke and mirrors. Because when you break down that $196 billion over 10 years, of which $46 billion is only new money, you're looking at, and when you consider the total amount that is spent in public health care, you're looking at a 2% increase per year. You break it down further to the $25 billion that is allocated as a separate uh, envelope for the bilateral agreements in the four priorities areas of which mental health and substance use health is there, the $25 billion over a base of about $240 billion is 1%. So uh, clearly it, it's, it isn't all about money, but to the extent that the federal government is adding to the envelope to try and help the system innovate, uh, transform itself, a 1% and 2% increase is I would think from many provincial perspectives rounding error. So in my view and in Cami's view, there's more that the federal government can do, particularly when they can, you consider that they jettisoned the Canada mental health transfer that they promised in the 2021 election. Nowhere to be found, nowhere to be seen. It's, on, it's not on anyone's uh, federal lips anymore. Uh, and, and that's a great disappointment knowing what was promised by the Trudeau government in this uh, space. And also it's a loss in the context of not having any protected funding for mental health and substance use health, health in this country. That's not to say that the funding uh, in terms of prioritization by the provinces won't go there, but it was an added level of protection to ensure that we had a dedicated envelope that ensured that some of the funding was going to where it was needed. Why don't I stop there? I've probably said a lot that, sure. that you might want to comment on, Michael. Um, well, before I comment on that, I did note we skipped over to the last slide quickly. Um, context setting, um, that slide that you saw was um, one of, a, of a, quite a comprehensive report um, that uh, we partnered on with Cami to produce for them. Um, my understanding, Glenn, is you released that fulsome report yesterday. Um, and perhaps in the chat, when you get a moment, you could link uh, to the, uh, to the um, audience, uh, the entirety of the report, so that they could see that work in context of a broader questions around, um, and, and just give them a bit of context in terms of what was in it. So, so um, there was a lot of questions around expectations for wait times, national standards, um, how whether people felt they were waiting longer or shorter um, periods of time um, for their service than they had previously. Uh, and there was a number of other things, perhaps it'd be useful just to provide a little more context uh, as to what was in there. And the other thing I wanted to highlight, and you did say this, but I do wanna reiterate it because it's very important. This was explicitly asked of people who had been accessing a mental health service in the past year. Um, so my suspicion would have been that had you have asked people who were not accessing services, those numbers might have moved or changed. But these are people with experience in trying to get help. Um, which I thought was a critical audience to reach when we were talking about that. So anything you want to comment on that while I pull up, um, and I'll pull up the next, uh, I'll pull up the, the two slides that you have here. Is there anything else contextually you want to talk about this um, quickly? Sure. I, I, I was going to jump back uh, to the slides that you, you just uh, covered. So if you want to move back to slide two, um, aside from my introductory remarks around the grades uh, of the provinces, as you just said, Michael, a couple of really uh, other interesting, and again, I think they're more confirmatory in the sense that a high, large majority of Canadians, 91% saying that they think that they shouldn't be waiting for care for, for no more than one month. And that's clearly not the case right now. When we look at the most recent wait times data that was released by the Canadian Institute for Health Information, we see that roughly half of Canadians are getting treated within a month. And then it kind of moves on in terms of months. Uh, of accessing care. The other interesting piece is the whole issue of evidence-based guidelines, benchmarks, and, and thresholds to measure it against. And there's strong support there in terms of, we need more of that. And, and many of you may know that Kai High is very active developing some indicators in this space. Uh, we do not really have a robust data set that tells us about the performance of the mental health and substance use health system. So there is work to be done, but there's an important foundation upon which to build on. And then the last point is again about 90% uh, 
um, were very strongly aligned, 80 to 90% about the need for the federal government to do more with the provinces and territories when it comes to increasing the supply of mental health care providers in this country. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, okay, anything you wanted to comment on this third slide or this third slide as well, or are we good on that? Um, no, I just included it for completeness. Uh, I mean, there's more data available that is not part of the slide deck. And that's where people want to dig a bit deeper that they can get in touch with myself or you, Michael, or Brittany. Um, all right, well, uh, while I pull up the questions to you, Glenn, uh, that we prepared, um, I'll just uh, ask Brittany if there's any questions or comments in the chat. Yes, absolutely. So the first comment was already answered about whether or not this deck will be available after the webinar. So the full report can be found where Glenn posted it into the chat. Um, a second question was, more of a comment was how interesting it would be to be able to compare these scores to ones given for um, phys physical illness and access to physical illness scores. Um, I don't know if that exists currently, but I agree that would be really interesting. Does not exist currently. Not, not to my knowledge, it doesn't exist. But um, in the previous work that the Wait Time Alliance and the CMA, Canadian Medical Association, had undertaken, that was a key piece of what they were focusing on, uh, again, to their credit. Okay. Um, another question was asking whether that seven cents that you um, said would be needed. Um, does that reflect just treatment or also treatment and promotion of mental health care? My understanding, and I'd have to double check, and I'm happy to double check, but it, it, um, it's the latter one. It was the more comprehensive piece. Okay. And, um, uh, to the and it's, those are estimates that we have seen. Right. Um, so I don't know if they're fully publicly available yet. Um, and there has been some work that I know the Mental Health Commission is actively involved in better understanding and figuring out exactly what is spent in the system, which is a bit of a policy challenge right now. Right, of course. And then another question was, um, was there any deep dive done, um, done into this yet? And for instance, was there any difference in scores given by, for instance, BIPOC populations or is that an analysis that hasn't been able to be done yet? No, that, that's an excellent question. And uh, to the extent that our budget was rather limited, mm -hmm. uh, I would say that's something for us to consider uh, at moving forward in the context of uh, future report cards that we want to develop. So a yeah. uh, great question. Unfortunately, no, not at this point. Um, just to interject here, um, I see there's a few questions being asked which are more directed um, to the overall work that we did um, looking at who's accessing what service. We'll get to that question in terms of what people are accessing um, with our poll 15 overview. Um, before I forget, there's two pieces of housekeeping I neglected to mention at the front end. As I mentioned, Brittany is the professional of this. I'm the fill-in. Um, one is that um, it is, of course, being recorded. Um, and the recording of this webinar will be available within uh, probably about three business days or less on our website. Uh, we do have a webinars uh, section on our website and generally we'll also put it where we keep our poll 15 reports. Um, and so for anyone who is not able to, uh, wants to go back and look at this, um, they're welcome to do so. Um, as another housekeeping issue, my colleague Joe Lynn will be posting a survey and following up with individuals, anyone who participated to ask um, how they thought about this so we can get feedback for our future polls as well. Um, and just as a reminder for everyone, Everything we will show you here today will be available um, either on Cami's website or our website. Um, uh, and uh, at the end, we'll talk a little bit very quickly about a few other resources we're bringing online, which will make it even easier to access our data. Uh, so now, Glenn, the question's for you. What do you see as the major barriers to mental health access for Canadians? So um, that's, a, I guess, uh, to me, it has a number of, it's like, uh, it's like um, peeling back an onion because it has so many interrelated pieces. But to me, the, the question is the narrowness of the system, both on the public and private side, to me is where I start. And I've already talked about the limits of the public system and that we need to start widening the goalposts in terms of better access into the system. But I would say that also occurs on the private side. Um, so when you think about those that if they don't have extended mental health benefits through their employer, they're paying out of pocket. And there are uh, uh, implications to that in terms of uh, socioeconomic status, stratas. Uh, but even if you are uh, insured, even if you have an employer-based um, health benefit plan, coverage is usually very limited. 
So when I think of the most recent Benefits Canada survey that came out several months ago, the median coverage is $750. Median, so 50% or below, 50% or above. Strikes me as very low and nowhere near the level of coverage that is needed in a system that is predominantly private when it comes to accessing mental health care in this country. So those are important barriers. Um, we need the issues around health human resources, critical in terms of making sure that we have an adequate supply, whether it's psychiatrists, family physicians, psychologists, social workers, counselors, um, et cetera. And, and I hopefully I'm not leaving anyone out in the Cami family, but you know what I mean. We need more breadth, which allows for more integration and more capacity. So I think that's really important. Um, another barrier that Brittany brought up is just the whole issue of how can we measure and monitor the system without appropriate indicators. And the mental health space is pretty good on the acute care side within hospital. It's still very weak when it comes to community-based care indicators. Uh, and that's an area that Kahe is aware of that we need to work with and develop uh, more effective. And then the last barrier I just raised, and I know there are others I'm missing, so if, if people online might wanna raise them, that's fine, is legislation that I would say, and this has been a CAMI issue, is that we need federal legislation that fully recognizes the relationship between mental health and physical health. And this is where we've called on the federal government. And we have a discussion paper on the CAMI website about creating a new piece of federal legislation called the Mental Health and Substance Use Healthcare for All Parity Act. And it's a complementary, it would be a companion piece of legislation that builds on the Canada Health Act. And in effect, extends the notion of uh, mutual accountabilities between the federal government and the provincial territorial governments in the sense of federal government is putting money on the table. Certain accountabilities are also recognized and understood in the mental health substance use health space to improve system performance at that level. And then the last thing, sorry, if I can just say one more thing, because I have it here in my notes, is leadership. And perhaps that's the first barrier is that we need more effective leadership uh, at the, I, I would say, at, not only within the public side, within the private side too. And we need leadership talking to one another because of the system that we have, it's intermingled. It's, it's, it's not like hospital and medical care that basically is hermetically sealed in a public system. Yeah. When it comes to access to mental health care, it commingles, it cuts across uh, very actively. And this is where, and to the credit to the Mental Health Commission of Canada, they've created a forum where we are trying to have a much more actively engaged and ongoing discussion between the public and private sides of the system. You don't want them competing with each other. If anything, you want to make sure there's maximum policy coordination when it comes to coverage. Um, that was comprehensive. A um, few odds and ends I want to add in just to fill in a few gaps here. Um, just so you know, our data does collect information about um, what people are accessing in mental health. And we do have a category of individuals who have indicated um, that they are not accessing help, but should be. So we're able to track the reasons that individuals have given that they're not accessing um, mental health supports. Um, and, and certainly not knowing where to get help has been a massive number, as well as the supports that I need cost money. Um, or I'm not able to afford it is another thing which speaks to the private benefit side that you were talking about. But the interesting thing we came across when we started asking people about um, mental health supports that they were accessing is what we found is people were generally accessing something. Um, so that if you needed a mental health support and you were put on a long-term wait list, you would access something else. You would access a, a community-based support or you would access an online support or you would access uh, an app or something. Um, so, so what we found was if you were just asking people, you know, are you not accessing support? Um, and what are the barriers to that access? You found that they were saying, well, I am accessing something, but it's not always the right thing, which is why we work very hard to try, to try and look into the question of not only um, are you not accessing something, but if you are accessing something, is it meeting your needs? And this is where that statistic that uh, Bell Canada used where they talked about how 50, they said one and two, the actual number was 56% of Canadians um, were, were not getting the need, were not getting their, who were accessing supports 
were not getting those needs met. So it was both a combination of people not accessing services, but it was also a combination of people accessing the wrong services or insufficient services for their needs, um, which was something that we wanted to delineate that those were those two groups. And that work was actually being done by Statistics Canada for many years in terms of looking at whether those needs are being met. And we just sort of picked up the ball and kept running with those same similar questions to try and answer that question. Um, moving on, and I know there's a number of chats going on, and that's great. I'm really happy to see it, but I just want to keep us moving forward. Brittany will comment on those in a second. Um, and Glenn, I'm going to skip over a couple of questions because I think you've answered a few of these already. Um, and I want to um, to talk about stigma uh, as a specific issue as well, too. So, um, you know, we still see, in fact, we did a study where we asked people with diagnosis is what they felt were major issues. And COVID-19 issues was tied for number one with uh, stigma. And of course, we're having this conversation all the time saying, of course, we're addressing stigma. Um, we're addressing stigmatizing behaviors. We're talking about it now, um, but we still don't see that in a lot of individuals, that they, a lot of individuals still feel that that stigma exists. So um, what do you think we can do to prevent stigma from uh, people, from preventing people from um, accessing mental health care? Yeah, the, uh, I mean, stigma to me is the whole issue of education. And the more that people are actually educated about the importance of your mental health, our collective mental health, the more likely people can consider sustainable policy solutions to implement. And that's as much for the general public that thinks about these issues, but it's equally important in the context of policymakers and those within government. So. Uh, it is necessary, it is important, it needs to be continued. Um, and, and again, you know, uh, over the years, issue, issues around lowering stigma, I think have occurred, but that doesn't mean the work is done. So when I think of the historic work that the Mental Health Commission of Canada has undertaken in, in this area, been very important. When I look at what the Community Addictions Peer Support Association, CAPSA, has done over the last few years has been extremely good and ramping up and taking it to another level in terms of person first language and other educational tools that are available. So I think that is absolutely important. We need to continue and I suspect it will always be ongoing in terms of um, refreshing the material and finding different ways to connect with Canadians to better understand, empathize, and if they can address and look at um, uh, solutions that can get people into the right spaces to deal with their mental health and substance use health issues. Uh, thank you so much. I do see we took a couple questions uh, coming in. You know what I'm going to do is I'm going to break after we're finishing here as I pull up poll 15 to address some of these questions. But um, I want to go on to, uh, is there any advice that you would give Canadians who are looking for mental health supports? And of course, there's a number of people on this webinar who are also um, providing guidance to those individuals as well in terms of how they get supports. Um, what would you provide, what guidance would you provide to Canadians or people who are talking to Canadians who need help um, about how they can access supports? So <clears throat> I'll preface my response by I'm just an economist, folks. So I'm more of a numbers driven guy. When people ask me through my career, are you a, you, are you a doctor? I just tell them I'm an operator. Um, so there's a difference. But obviously uh, where you can and you are comfortable in speaking to friends, colleagues, family, speaking with a, a, a family physician, there are reputable tools that are available on the internet. Uh, many, whether it's at CAMH or Wellness Together Canada, just to think of two, CMHA has some tools. So th there are some tools out there to help you navigate uh, your path. And, and hopefully uh, that will lead you to the um, tools, treatments, et cetera, that you may need. Um, before we move on to poll 15 oh, questions and then our poll 15 overview, um, can you, uh, Glenn, is there anything else that we haven't covered yet that you want to share? Sure. Well, I did see a question in the chat box from Steve Spruill asking about the recommended range uh, when it comes, knowing that $750 on the private side is low. Yeah. CAMI doesn't have a range. And, and of course, CAMI is comprised of 16 national health organizations of, of those with lived and living experience and mental health care providers. So the, on the provider side, in terms of recommended rates, it would be expected that there's a bit of variation. I can tell you during my day job with the Canadian Psychological Association, the recommended 
rate of coverage is $3,500 to $4,000 a year. And that's really just dealing with the average uh, volume or dose of psychotherapy that is needed in the general case, knowing that, of course, it varies on an individual case-by-case -case, uh, basis. To your question, what I would say is stay vigilant. Uh, we are not there yet. In fact, we are nowhere near there yet. There is much work to be done for all of us in terms of making sure that the system vaults forward. And persistence when it comes from a policy, if, if I've learned nothing else in my 35 plus years in the policy space, is persistence can pay off and it can pay big policy dividends. Uh, and that's something that we need to continu continue. And, and fair enough, this sector of the system has been very patient, uh, but we need to continue to push in terms of the solutions that we want to see, keep politicians accountable and decision makers accountable. And this kind of evidence, for example, that Michael will speak to in terms of what MHRC does is vital to that conversation. So onwards we move, hopefully together. Thank you, Brent. Um, Brittany, before I pull up poll 15, um... Is there anything from questions that we need to address that we're not going to cover with our poll 15 coverage? I believe most of the questions in the chat have either been answered by Glenn um, or we will be covering in our chat. Um, one did just come in through our Q&A asking if there's any initiatives in place currently to include more mental health resources in grade schools. I'm not sure if either of us can speak to that at the moment. It's um, we uh, the Canadian psychological. So from a CAMI standpoint, I'm not aware uh, of any activity in that space. And I think that's a really good question, just given the importance of where children spend a lot of their time. From the Canadian Psychological Association, we just released a policy paper on that whole issue in terms of expanding mental health capacity within Canada schools. And I, and I can put in the chat just our website if you want to go and see that report. Was the question in context of more mental health literacy in schools? or more supports for mental health in schools? Um, both, okay. The person just answered both. Okay, so the answer to this question um, is, I, I do think that we have a need for more mental health supports in school. We are not an advocacy-based organization, so we try to not take very aggressive stances on things along that lines, but um, there are there is ample research that uh, has demonstrated that um, mental health challenges caught early, uh, it's far more effective to catch them earlier. We also know in several provinces, the wait times are significantly longer for children and youth um, than they are um, for, for older Canadians. Um, and and uh, honestly, you've got, you know, kids in school, why not take advantage of that time? Um, and so I, and I have seen some investments um, and there's been some policy developments with youth wellness hubs and several investments from provincial governments into youth uh, based services, which I'm really happy to see, but I, I still don't think it's enough. Um, the other thing that, uh, in terms of literacy, absolutely agree, mental health literacy. It, we've done some work looking at consumption of mental health media, um, and it is almost uh, fourfold um, in terms of the number of young people who are talking and thinking about their mental health or conversing around their mental health or consuming media around their mental health. Uh, the numbers compared to an older generation are staggeringly different. This is a huge generational divide as it comes to mental health consumption. Um, so you have a, a captive audience that's talking about their mental health significantly in those younger generations. Uh, but, um, uh, and, and so there are things happening in schools to get literacy rates up. Um, but it doesn't mean we can't have a comprehensive uh, means of, of, uh, of trying to support that, nor does it mean we can't have a comprehensive means of trying to track it as well, because when you measure it, it helps matter. And Glenn's an economist, I'm a data nerd. So we're the sort of people that's, that would say, like, you're going to measure it, it's going to make a bigger impact. Um, any other questions that are not covered by poll 15, Brittany? There's one question, um, two actually, that kind of tie together. Uh, wondering if wait times seem to be more dependent on the type of disorder being treated and whether access becomes more problematic for people experiencing complex issues. I'm going to throw that one to Glenn. Um, that's an interesting question. I, I don't have the, the I, I thought maybe you folks had the, uh, could break down wait times by mental health disorder. We um, could. I don't think we've done that work. We have not done we could. That. Okay. Um, for those that uh, with severe or acute severe uh, mental health issues, my sense is 
they're getting quicker access. It's like going to the ER uh, or having, you know, physical trauma that that may get you into the system a little bit quicker than those that are in the mild to moderate category. That, and that's just my experiential kind of sense. And I can't point to any data to the person who's asking the question. Um, just before we dive into our poll 15 results, I think that's a really great segue to say that um, the results that you're about to see in poll 15 are a very, very small shot, snapshot of the data that we collect through our polling initiative. So as Glenn brought up, we do have the data to break down a lot of things that we just haven't had the capacity to do yet. Um, that said, our data sets, sets are massive. I think we have about 50,000 respondents at this point, and they are freely available to researchers if they are interested in doing their own analyses. Uh, great, so I'll move on. And then if we have time at the end, we'll take more questions. Um, this would be an over, and thank you, Glenn, um, for your insightful conversations. As always, Glenn and I sit on a number of committees and uh, things together, and he's always so insightful and uh, well-informed on this. It's always great talking to you. Uh, so this would be uh, what, what we're doing here is we're going to show you the results of our 15th data collection, our 15th poll collecting mental health indicators of Canadians. Um, as a bit of background on this, we've been collecting data since late March 2020, um, functionally the start of the pandemic. Uh, we realized very early on that mental health would have impacts on uh, COVID, would have impacts on mental health, and we started tracking across a number of factors um, from celebrated scales to clinical screeners, uh, distressed scales and a number of other things. Um, as Brittany indicated, we've taken a relatively a kitchen sink approach to our data, which is we are trying to collect as many mental health indicators as possible, as much as we can about service use, um, and as many demographic factors as possible from family size, family status, income, education, ethnicities, um, uh, job status, um, employment sector. Um, we're trying to collect everything we possibly can. And we, what we do is we report once per quarter on a data collection. And then we have 47 data partners that we turn the data out to, um, including multiple governments um, and uh, multiple charities and research organizations who then parse the data for their own specific needs. So what we're gonna cover today is our point in time of February, 2023. Um, and Brad, I do see your, you raise your hand. I will um, answer it when we when I'm done this, if you don't mind. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do here is, is just show you a point in time from February 2023. Um, and as a result, um, we've also uh, uh, we also do deep dives. So we have another group that goes in um, and actually looks at specific demographics um, across a period of time. So we're able to analyze um, uh, any particular demographic. Um, we also have another group that is working on um, qualitative research. So we're trying to understand through interviews what's happening with certain groups. Right now, we've just published a qualitative research brief on the LGBTQ uh, community and what we found in that community. And I think next week, uh, Brittany will be publishing a paper on why people are not accessing pay uh, why people are not accessing services and why they told us they're not accessing services, which takes it beyond this quantitative data that we have as well. Um, so if you have any questions about this project, we're more than happy to talk about it. Um, and, and our big announcement is that um, in the near future, probably about two weeks away, we'll be launching uh, in, a, in a more substantive way our, our data hub. Um, so we do have an interactive data portal on our website where you're able to um, play with the provinces, the age, the data collection time period, um, gender, and actually look at about 25 different indicators by timelines. Um, that has significantly increased from our last data hub, which only had about six indicators. We've increased it to about 25. Now, we collect about 100 and over 100 indicators, so we're still only scratching the surface of the work that we do. Um, but I think these are the most popular ones that people are trying to, to, to discuss. Great. Uh, methodology page talking about um, uh, what we collected this period. And you can see, again, the, the uh, margins of error, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what we did find in February 2023 was uh, we did see an improvement in mental health indicators in around spring 2022, um, and they have been slowly improving through the 2022, and then in February, we saw that that improvement had stopped and had gotten slightly worse, and we're talking in the, in, you know, one to 2%, so it's not a significant movement um, negative in any way. It's relatively just flatlined um, as opposed to continuous improvement. We did see, um, for example, 
Uh, and of course, we did look at that from uh, GAD7, which is uh, the anxiety screener, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, and then we looked at PHQ-9, uh, which are, of course, clinical screeners for that. We did look at burnout, which had been improving um, through 2022 as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think our functional question is, is are we at a new normal or is this something that we see in February? Because we do know from past collections that um, seasonal affective disorder does tend to bring our numbers down a little bit through the winter months. And so we're really anxious to collect our next sample in uh, in early April, where we'll be able to look at that to see if it's improving through the spring as well, too. Um, the one thing that we thought was interesting as well is the number of Canadians accessing mental health service in the past year has risen sli slightly. Um, it had gone from about 10% up to about 12%, um, while 2% is uh, within the uh, pretty close to the margin of error. Um, even 2% represents uh, well over half a million more Canadians accessing mental health service. Um, so that is a sizable increase when you think about it in the context of all Canadians as well, too. And we did see some movement in how people were accessing service, it, whether it be through um, uh, online supports, psychologists, psychotherapists, um, and we we did see that there was a significant increase in the number of people who were indicating that they were accessing a family doctor or GP to talk about their mental health. Um, one great thing we've been able to do is we've been looking at sort of the social determinants of health, as well as some of the uh, pressures and uh, challenges that people are having. Um, so we did see, oh, sorry. I'm stuck here. Um, I'm going forward here. Hold on. It's my tab. Okay, here we are. Um, so we did note that inflation is having um, is not having a negative um, impact on um, about half of Canadians, but for the half of Canadians who are impacted. So, so either you said no, it's not affecting me at all, but for the people who are indicating. Um, that they are struggling with their mental health as a result of inflation, those challenges are getting worse. And we did note significantly higher rates of self-rated anxiety, depression, um, diagnosis of mood disorder, suicide ideation, which is extremely high for that group, um, alcohol and cannabis dependencies, um, and less being able to handle stress well. So, so for the group of people who are struggling, as a result and indicated that they're struggling because of inflationary pressures, those are getting uh, they're, they're, those are a number of indicators that are indicating significantly worse mental health challenges, uh, with the caveat that for the other half of Canadians who are not indicating that struggling, we didn't see any of those, those particular challenges. So there's a big divide happening in terms of whether or not that's happening or not. Um, uh, it's affecting your mental health. Um, we did notice, of course, uh, increases in negative mental health indicators in parents of children under the age of nine. Um, and, and again, it sort of makes sense um, that there are a lot of in individuals who have families who are indicating that they're struggling more as a result of inflation. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead. Um, all of this is available on our website, mhrc.ca. Again, there, for anyone who's new uh, to this, you know, we've not seen the, these new diagnoses of uh, mood disorders, anxiety and depression or other mood disorders. They've been relatively flat for a while, but slightly increasing um, since COVID, as you can imagine, they're continuously going up. Um, but I'm not going to cover these in great detail because these have not changed significantly. But if you're new to this project, um, you know, we have seen this over a period of time, this slow increase in diagnoses since COVID. Again, um, about 10% of Canadians have indicated that their anxiety is high um, on a self-rated scale. Uh, and again, this is about, uh, you know, before, before COVID, this was about 7%. So it's still uh, up about 40%, 35, 40% from pre-COVID norms, but it's significantly improved since from the, uh, during COVID. At the worst of COVID, we saw it in the 25 to 28% range. We, of course, look at who's indicating high levels of anxiety, what specific demographic groups. Speaking about where it was pre-COVID, um, during COVID, and since COVID, the recovery period. We do provide data um, uh, by province. We actually can also micro-target by postal code, so we can look at even smaller regions than this. Um, for those who are new, Quebec has always had the lowest uh, levels of uh, anxiety and depression. Um, and Atlantic Canada, uh, as of the last poll, and uh, I think it started around 
August or uh, August or October of last year had some of the highest levels of anxiety as well. We originally thought that it might be related to the hurricane, um, but it's remained consistently high. So we don't quite know exactly why Atlantic Canada continues to be high in anxiety. Uh, for those who are looking, this is the, um, uh, is, which, which one's this one? This is the, oh, this is the Kessler this Psychological Atlanta. Distress. Yeah, this is the Kessler Psychological Distress Scale, which looks at general psychological distress. Um, it's pretty stable. Uh, we have the uh, anxiety, the uh, generalized anxiety or the GAD7 scoring. I think this is interesting because um, this has not, this didn't get significantly worse during the pandemic um, and, and uh, has improved slightly, but is now back up to around 14%, um, which is not horrific. But when you actually look at the, uh, the GAD7, the scoring has not moved significantly from the pandemic, but it also didn't get significantly worse. It did get slightly worse. And when you're talking about two and 3%, you're still talking about a million Canadians. Um, but uh, depends how you want to categorize this in terms of was it a significant or uh, a not significant movement um, when you're looking at things moving two to 3% one way or another. Uh, this is the, uh, the clinical screener for um, depression, the PHQ-9. Again, 11%, um, that is not very high at all. It has continued to um, pull 15. It was at a high of 14% um, when we looked at it uh, in the middle of the pandemic and now it's down to 11. So this has slightly improved. Can I just jump in really quick to say, um, for those who aren't familiar with these screener tools, the Kessler 10 that we looked at earlier looks only at those who have rated their anxiety or depression as high. And then the GAD7 and the PHQ9, excuse me, look at, um, the general population. So kind of what this is showing us is that those who are experiencing mental health challenges um, are continuing to experience severe challenges, whereas the rest of Canadians since the height of the pandemic might seem to be get like to be improving. Those who are struggling are really struggling. Yeah, I think it's worth noting here that of the people who um, rated their anxiety or depression high on self-rated scales, a full, what is that, 76% of them or three out of four we're actually showing moderate to severe uh, symptoms of, of disorder. Uh, I'm gonna skip through. So managing stress and anxiety remains relatively static. Um, uh, we do see a, uh, um, a slight connections between housing insecurity, although this hasn't really been a catastrophic as of yet. We have seen some challenges with, with on the marginal levels with um, housing insecurity and mental health indicators. Um, food insecurity um, has continued to go up. Um, so you can see in poll 13, which would have been six months ago, 30% of Canadians were, 33% uh, of Canadians were indicating either being reliant on a food bank or feeling that they were imminently going to, or they, there was a probability that they would, and that's gone up to 36%. So we have seen an increase in the number of Canadians feeling like they might have some food insecurity. And of course, we do track that against um, mental health indicators as well. And yes, it does correlate with mental health indicators. Uh, this is the audit um, for alcohol dependency. I'm going to skim through some of this because we don't have enough time. Cannabis dependency, again, this is all on our website. Uh, suicide ideation has been relatively static, although we've seen this extremely high among young people and LGBTQ, um, and we've commented on that in the past. I'll skip through a lot of this. Um, the one thing I wanted to highlight was that resiliency has remained relatively stable. So we talk about the challenges that some people are having with uh, mental health, and what we've continued to say is that that doesn't represent a majority of the Canadians. For a majority of Canadians, they still remain resilient, they still remain that they're, they they might be feeling some anxiousness, but they're going to recover on their own. Um, but we also don't want to marginalize the you know 30 percent of Canadians that are not feeling resilient, um, which would be at higher risk of showing uh, mental health challenges. Relationships with friends and family. Very interesting um, findings here uh, that we've recently uncovered, which is one of the greatest determinants of whether or not someone is indicating high anxiety. Um, depression on either self-rated scales or clinical screeners 
was how they responded to, I have people I can count on. Um, that was a huge determinant for whether or not people were actually indicating anxiety or depression, um, more than most of the other indicators we could find. Uh, this is a question, are you interested in life? Are you happy? Are you engaged? Our friends from the Public Health Agency of Canada added this, and we're happy to collect it. Anyone's here from PHAC, it's a great question. Um, anger questions, again, um, look at anger and the correlations with mental health. Uh, we, of course, commented that about 12% of Canadians have access support in the past year. 4%, um, it's been around 5% of Canadians have indicated that they should be accessing service but are not. We know what demographics those people are. Um, we know um, what kind of service they're accessing. So, for example, we know that about one third of uh, mental health care access is happening through the public health care system. Um, if you were to break that down, that's uh, about 65, 70% of people in that 33% are accessing it through their GP or family doctor. Um, we do know that about 16% of people are accessing it through pri uh, private health care insurance. Um, uh, and we, we sort of get a sense of what they're accessing as well. And um, we do know that uh, um, how long they're accessing that data. We know how frequently they're accessing that on um, those types of services. Pause here for a second. Agnes and I have seven minutes left. <clears throat> and Brittany is asking me why I use the long version of this report. <clears throat> uh, I always use the long version of this report. Uh, I'm a data nerd. Um, uh, so uh, looking at what people are accessing, if they're accessing a free online service, um, uh, community-based supports, uh, what they're paying, what they're accessing if it's out of pocket, why they're paying out of pocket. We have information on that as well, too. Um, why they're not accessing help if they feel they need it. Uh, whether I mentioned this earlier, is it meeting their needs? Uh, are they accessing something else that they should, um, while they're waiting for something better that they should be accessing? Again, I think it's always surprising that so many people are not getting their needs met from the services they're trying to access. And we look at their level of satisfaction. And going forward, one of the analyses we will do will be looking at um, levels of satisfaction by how people are accessing services to get a sense of how the system is working. And that leaves us about five minutes for questions. I apologize for rushing through the end of that, um, but I wanted to make sure you had a sense of what we were collecting. Um, and I'm more than happy to take questions for the last five minutes here. We do have two questions in the Q&A. Um, one of them is wondering why we primarily focus just on anxiety and depression rather than looking at um, more mental health challenges. Yeah, um, I think because we're trying to look for things that are the two, the two most prominent in terms of when you've looked at historical data as what's most prominent in the population. When you're doing population level studies, you're looking for things that can generate you a reasonable size sample. Um, the, the, the thing I wanted to add is I was really happy that StatsCan, um, every 10 years or so, they've done a massive collection on mental health indicators, and they do look at the breadth of mental health challenges that people are having. And it is, um, it's not done frequently or updated enough to my liking, which, um, but they did collect in summer 2022 um, indicators of a lot of those um, other mental health challenges schizophrenia people are and, and more complex challenges that people are having and they will produce and I think they're probably it's due later this year if I recall correctly from talking to them um, that we at some point there will be a, an updated list of um, mental health uh, populations um, like what percentage of the population are affected by other mental health challenges from StatsCan later this year which would be great and they only do it every 10 years so it's going to be a great indicator when it comes out to for data nerds. Caitlin, I see that you're asking if we're planning on integrating any qualitative data, and that is exciting news for us. Um, this year, we've been fortunate to be able to start collecting qualitative data. So we've released one report looking at two as LGBTQ communities in Canada, um, and that one can be found on our website. And we will, in the coming days, be publishing a report on why Canadians say that they're not accessing care when they feel like they need it. So that one's going to be coming out soon. And then we do have two more reports coming out in the next month. Um, that will be looking at parents of young children and um, people working in high burnout sectors. 
yes, those are, those are the two that are coming out soon. And then we will be continuing to do this for the, at the very least over the next couple of years. We're relatively prolific with publications. We also have another one coming out with resiliency indicators next week as well. Mm -hmm. Another question was asked um, among the group of parents of children under the age of nine years old, um, are there differences between um, genders or single parents that we have found in our research? Sorry, I was reading the question that came in the chat. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. Just looking at um, how uh, parents of younger children under nine um, seem to be struggling more. Um, yeah. Is there any difference that we found between um, genders or between single parents or... Yeah, so um, I will admit we haven't looked at this particular question um, in probably a year. Um, so the information I'm about to share with you is somewhat outdated. We do have the new data, we just haven't got to it. Um, but I, I recall from about a year ago when we looked at this, that we did see that it was primarily among uh, women, um, that there wasn't much of a difference between men um, parents. Um, but I'd have to go back and rerun the analysis for now. Um, and we did look among single parents as well. Uh, and I recall it being uh, significantly higher for that group as well. And we were, um, but we'd also want to run that against uh, um, some of the other uh, run of regression analysis so we could extrapolate out from other um, factors that are more predominant among single parents as well too. Um, looking at Lisa's question asking what scales are used to diagnose anxiety and depression in your study. We don't diagnose anything in our study. The screeners that we use are specifically um, screeners of symptoms. Any mention of diagnosed anxiety and depression are um, reported by our respondents as having been pre professionally diagnosed. So we use self-rated scales and clinical screeners of symptoms only. And we, uh, to reaffirm what Brittany said, we do ask, have you received a diagnosis from a professional? And we do list off the uh, number of professionals as well. So we're trying to get that information. And then those clinical screeners are not the only way you would diagnose someone. So we, we try and avoid language where we indicate um, a, a diagnosis. Uh, Michelle's wondering if any of our research touches on eating disorders, and our research hasn't yet touched on eating disorders. If we do that in the future, and it's certainly a possibility, None of us are experts on the subject, so we would want to make sure that we are doing it completely appropriately and comprehensively. So if we decide to do this in the future, it probably wouldn't be in the near future because we would just want to make sure that we were doing it, doing it correctly. But it's not to say that it won't happen. I'm cognizant that we're coming up on an hour. Um, I can stop the recording um, and obviously release anyone who, who has other things to do. But if you have more questions for us, we can stay on for a few more minutes and just turn off the recording. Um, I'll take this last minute to thank Glenn for his time um, and express appreciation for this. Um, uh, and I hope you, we all learned something from it. 